and uh, I think it's right with Waco, Texas. Ross McLean is uh, joining us here. I don't know if you remember much about uh, Waco, Ross, but uh, obviously it was 20 years ago now. And you know, what are, what are your reflections? Yeah, well, uh, good to be with you, Joe. Waco was something else when it happened, when it went down. You know, a lot of that was covered reasonably live, as you said. It, it wasn't Twitter with blackberries then, but uh, we pretty much got to see what happened. And I suppose the biggest aftermath of that, Joe, is it's going to be what we're going to talk about a little bit later here, is all of the inquiries and how they tried to get back to figure out exactly what happened and how they led up to that. And it was almost... Uh, sort of a, a miniature version of the, the Kennedy assassination inquiries, you know. It was just, I don't think they ever really got to the truth of it, and there was a lot of people dead. How, what is the number? Do you have that? Uh, I, th- I think the total uh, dead was 76, I think it was, Joe. I think about 23 of them were children. Well, uh, it's just a lot of people, and it didn't ha- they didn't have to be dead on that day. The issue was forced, and again, it gets glossed over. Um, I don't think anyone was charged for it. Oh, no, they had a lot of commissions, and then they had a lot of, uh, you know, excuses and things that were said that turned out to be not true later and some things that were true. And, um, you know, it, it brings uh, it brings around the whole, you know, and we're still struggling today with police accountability to make it fair for the police and fair for the people, Joe. You know, uh, we with Tom Godfrey, we were talking about G20. It sort of always comes up, and I'm sure you saw that story in the paper Today, but I mean, is there any point in in, in having that hearing against those uh, two senior officers? Uh, everyone, I mean, I feel bad for them. I don't think anything's going to happen. Um, but you know, it seems like they're the face on all the problems with G twenty. Is that fair, or is it not well, about fair anymore? Uh, you know what? I've, I've got a, I've got a slightly different take on it. I missed the story that was out in the paper on if they announced that they're going to be proceeding with the trials for those two officers, but. In my mind, the the real face of uh, the G20 was the people of Toronto, Joe, not not the guys in uniforms and everything else. It's, it's about the people of Toronto. And what it comes down to is, you know, all of the police oversight and all of these things are done not to punish police. It's really done so that the public can have confidence in the police. I mean, that's really at the, at the, the heart and soul of the goal of the oversight. I don't, think that, I don't think that happens, though. I think that the police uh, have such a strong... Uh, you know, understanding of the law, and they have w- uh, deep pockets to deal with it. I'll give you an example. It was on Friday night. I wrote a column, and this was in Saturday Sun, about the murder uh, that happened of the young man. It was like an ETF call or a gangs and you know gangs kind of uh, raid, and his name was Eric Ossaway, 26 years old, and he was shot in the back. And again, he wasn't the intended target. It, they were looking for his brother. It's the wrong guy. And he comes out in a body bag. Originally, uh, the SIU uh, director, Ian Scott, charged uh, the officer, it's a good officer, by the way, David Kavanaugh, um, who had been a hero in the Jane Kriba arrest, and, and those suspects. So, you know, obviously somebody that's brave and, and, and all that kind of thing. But they, they charged him with manslaughter. I, I'm not clear. I'm anxious to hear what you think about it. But... Then the Crown upgraded it to second-degree murder. This is all covered uh, throughout the thing. Um, and then on Friday, nobody was at this hearing. No one knew about the hearing. The murder charges, second-degree murder, and the manslaughter charges that were, was all, you know, dissolved, drop right there by a judge named uh, Michael Block, who, by the way, is the same judge who was uh, up in the case in Barry. I don't know if you followed this, Ross, but what are your thoughts on it? Well... Uh, th- this goes back to the whole thrust of what I was talking about, the police oversight and confidence in the police. You know, this this officer, Kavanaugh, as you say, is a decorated officer who did well. He did great in the Dr- Jane Kriba case. Here he is now under this, what, what I'm going to call a cloud, uh, because we've had an incident where um, a man died, and we had, uh, what happens is, as soon as the police shoot someone and they die, Joe, with the with the SIU, the public hears nothing. A publication ban basically goes on it. You don't hear any of the evidence. You don't hear what happened. All you know is somebody's dead and a policeman uh, was there when it happened. It goes from there to you wait for months, maybe a year, till you hear about the charges, if there are going to be any charges. Then you hear about them, but of course you don't hear any evidence yet or what happened yet. 
Joe, then it goes to trial. But as it goes to trial, there's a publication ban put on it. But this, so didn't, this didn't go to trial. I mean, that's the point that I was trying to make is that... No, 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 but this, yeah. is, this is my point. The yeah. preliminary trial, I went to the preliminary trial, which had a publication ban on it. Right. So what happened is some discussion of some of the evidence was put forward there. And this judge, who has quite a controversial background as far as decisions involving police cases, as best I can tell, just dismissed uh, everything out of hand, said, no, no charge is gone. Now, what happens as soon as he does that, because he's dismissing the charges, no one's allowed to write anything about any of the preliminary evidence. So nobody knows what happened, other than we had a couple of statements from the police lawyer. Yeah, why was it upgraded to second-degree murder? That's what, No one will ever know that. Well, we'll never know. And, and, and what we don't know so far, I mean, we haven't heard the SIU still has a chance, and the Crown does actually, it's really the Crown's position, to be able to appeal it. They've got 30 days from the time. But, you know, the evidence, evidence, the information we heard from the police lawyer was something about the gun went off accidentally somehow. Well, how, you know, okay, so a gun went off accidentally. Well, how does that happen? You know, if we're not having a trial, we need to be having an inquest. I mean, we should all be concerned when a gun goes off accidentally and someone's back and they end up dead and no one's responsible. Well, I so, think, yeah, I think that's a good a good point. I think the other thing, uh, Ross McLean is my guest from RossMcLeanSecurity.com, a former Toronto copper who helps us here on the late shift with a crime file uh, just about every week now. And I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate that, Ross, particularly tonight. But you know, uh, Joe, one point I want to get in before you go on. You know, when it comes to our police and this officer Kavanaugh, we don't expect perfection in our police, right? We, do, we don't expect perfection. You'll never get it. None of us can meet that standard. What we do want to see is someone made a judgment call that it was a reasonable judgment. They did it within their training. They weren't negligent, and they weren't criminal. I mean, that's what we want to know. That, you know, that's the standard, not perfection, not perfection. And also, I think if you charge somebody with the murder, there should be a trial. I've never heard of it ever uh, thrown out in a preliminary hearing. Uh, particularly uh, without anybody even knowing about the herring. Uh, well, you know, I mean, j- just no one knows it, about this story except for we're talking about it here. It came on Friday night. I heard about it uh, through some tweets, but it really, it really hit the black hole of the news cycle, and it's gone. But, but here's the other part that's now they're separate instances, they're different. When we had that young black man killed out at the Connections, you know, housing project. It turns out it was a buddy of his with a gun that supposedly went off accidentally. Right. Right. So almost sounding the same sort of things. However, the young man that's involved in that one, he's still up on manslaughter charges and he's being held. No one's saying, well, oh, it was an accident. Let it go. Now, now, we don't know any of the information in that one either. But what I am saying is what it does is it doesn't do the officer or the public a service to have him cleared with evidence put out so that everybody can agree. You know what? That was a reasonable decision. That was okay. There's no cloud. But in well, fact, there is a difference. Uh, there is quite a bit of difference in that the officer, Kavanaugh, is trained. He went in there uh, with his weapon as part of his job and all of that. But uh, but the overall point is where the, in the other case, uh, they shouldn't have had it. It was an illegal firearm. Uh, oh, no, yeah, I'm yeah. not saying they're, they're completely the same. But, yeah. I mean, you do, you do raise the issue, which is also important, is off, Officer Kavanaugh was on the ETF, so he was highly trained, highly proficient in his weapons. So, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it for granted that he was. And somehow his submachine gun went off accidentally. I mean, we, I mean, they should be figuring something out there. You don't want that to happen again if for no other reason. Well, I that. agree with you, and I think that, uh, you know, you heard it here on the, on the late shift. Ross McLean is calling for a coroner's inquest. I think that's a perfect way to, to deal with it. If they're not going to appeal it, that is, on the murder charge, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think they're going to. Nobody's returning anybody's calls on that, so... I think this one's over, and uh, and the the kid's dead, and no one cares. Well, it is, like I said, it is about the public confidence, and uh, th- that's what we need in our police to get the confidence back. And this is where the oversight system, Joe, all all aspects of it, from the OIPRD to the SIU uh, to the police chiefs, it's just broken. It's it's conflicted. No one's happy with it. It doesn't suit the police, as we saw with Constable Muirhead, the York Regional Police Officer we talked about last week on yeah. the show. Yeah, that's my next question. So go ahead. Well, well, Officer Muirhead. I mean, that that story has gone all over North America. Basically, it's been picked up by you, U.S. Uh, York Regional Station. Police Constable Damian Muirhead. Let's tell the the listeners what happened. Well, he's the officer uh, who's out in York Region. He's a black officer who last year in Victoria Day, 2011 ended up going to a call at someone's uh, 
for lack of a better a short way of saying it, a drunken redneck party uh, where someone was injured with a vehicle and some other things. And while he was there, he was called racial names and insulted and other things as he was trying to deal with the crowd and figure out what happened and manage things. He later finds himself, to shorten the story down, uh, charged by his own police force for neglect of duty for not investigating the slurs against himself and insubordination. It's ridiculous. I mean, it's, it's just unbelievable to put the guy in that position. And that's why this story's gone around the world. Oh, exactly. I mean, it was listed on some of the stations under weird news. Yeah, no kidding. You know, so, so, here, so here's a constable that on the face of it uh, seems to have been doing the right thing, not escalating, managing it with a very difficult situation, trying to do his work, and his own department... I mean, to me, it seems like someone's got an axe to grind with him. We have to hear the case that uh, the prosecutor wants to put out. The prosecutor in York Region is quite disturbed that the story has made it to the media before any evidence has come out. However, you know, they, they should take a long, hard look at this one because everybody's going to be watching this one. It better be a fair and just reason why they're charging this officer. It just better be fair and just. It better not be that he's a great, smart guy who's got the patience of, uh, of uh, Solomon sort of thing, if you will and manage this correctly, and someone just is second-guessing him on his judgment for how he handled it. Still no one will be accountable. Uh, Ross McLean is my guest. Uh, let's go over to the new chief in Barrie. Tell me about her. Yeah, that's pretty wild, and that's, that's, that's a great thing. She's a, a former Metro Toronto Police uh, officer, Kimberly Green. She's going up to Barrie. She's taking over the service up there. She's got over 30 years on with Toronto. Uh, she's come up through the ranks, and she's pretty much... Uh, I had no dealings with her myself, but I was looking at her resume. She's a very academic person. She's been through just about every course. Uh, she understands, you know, the law, management, all the things that you need. Because these days, more than ever, I'm a believer that the police need strong and continuing education in order to keep up with the changing laws, the case laws, and the way society is going. So I think they've got themselves a good chief. Uh, they stole her off of uh, here in Toronto. Uh, maybe we should be asking for some compensation, maybe a decent deputy or two back. I don't know. Interesting. Uh, Kimberly Greenwood, uh, good luck uh, as the uh, the new Barry chief. She uh, takes over that job on the 26th of March. And speaking of uh, trying to get a promotion, there's a story out of the Ontario Civilian Police Commission that's pretty interesting about the constable, uh, UM, we don't know the name, constable number two, uh, was, and I wrote about this at the time, it was back in 2011, uh, two years ago, February, uh, when he was in the exam uh, for the sergeant's exam over at uh, the c and &E, uh, and then there was a female officer from the same division that was in a car with radio uh, equipment and reading the, the actual test and the, the, the manual so you get the answers right. Uh, it, it's right out of uh, Keystone Cops or out of uh, uh, Police Academy or something, and yet... Um, Tell us the rest. I mean, it's, uh, it's pretty pretty interesting. Yeah, it really is uh, sort of Keystone cop Cops. I think really Police Academy might be the best description of it. Uh, but, but what happened, this is just another example of how we're failed, we don't get the information uh, for this. You know, the whole case is written up. It's a good, uh, it's a good site if uh, any of your listeners want to look at it, Joe. The Ontario C Civilian Police Commission, they're the ones that hear all the appeals on police charges, and they post the decisions up there. And you can read the summaries of the cases, and you can find out what a policeman or policewoman has to do to get charged for something. It will shock you when you look at a lot of them. In this one, the evidence came out that this woman actually worked uh, with a man she had a relationship with, another officer from the same division. And over the course of three years, three separate times, she worked using these electronic devices to speak to him when he's in taking the exams to feed him the answers when he got stuck and didn't know the answers. So they did it over three years. And, you know, they don't name the, the, uh, the male constable in the decision. But, I mean, he failed each time, Joe, even with this help, which is the amazing thing. They, they name the, uh, the female constable. But I'm going to let the listeners, if you're really interested, go to the Ontario Civilian Police Commission website and get it there. Because I, I don't want to, you know. No, I mean, it's, 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 yeah. that's, that's not the point of it. But, yeah. but you, know, the, you know, the question that comes out of this is what, what she ended up getting for discipline was basically busted all the way back to starting all over again to climb her way up through the ranks. She was busted uh, down two classes of constable from fourth to yeah. second. Yeah, and it's going to take her a little bit of time to climb back up to get back up to first. But now How do you, know, you send someone like her, and, this, and the other guy hasn't had his, uh, I'll break a little news here, I found out uh, Constable Wendy Drummond told me 
earlier today or yesterday, actually, that uh, that he is going to have his case heard in May, and he's still working in the division, and uh, you know he's been charged under the Police Act. But how is it that there's zero tolerance on the people that they go out and police in so many things, and yet these people still have jobs? I don't want to see anyone lose their job. But my well, God, you know, if, it's if, if, about, if to me, yeah. it's not about losing the job. It's about how high do we set the bar, you know, for people who are entrusting, you know, to go into court and give evidence and give testimony. I mean, one of the issues is if, if an officer with a background like this officer, let's not talk about her, but let's say another officer who's at some uh, background of deceit on a repeated basis, goes up and testifies against you in a criminal case in court, but you don't have the ability to find out about his background or the mistakes or things he may have said. Well, this is this is duplicitous. Uh, this this is this is cheating. Listen, hold that thought. Uh, Ross McLean's my guest. We'll be right back uh, after this. You're listening to In Depth Radio News Talk 1010. Welcome back to the Late Shift Scrawler with you. I think I'm going to make it. Um, thank you for listening, and thank you, Ross, and all the other guests that helped me through this uh, night. It sounds worse than I feel. I don't feel. I felt other nights worse than I sounded. But uh, anyway, hope you're able to stick with me. And Ross, uh, we got to whip through some things here. We don't have a lot of time left. So let me throw them at you. Um, police in Hollandale Beach, uh, Florida, uh, you know, they're going to update this Toronto murder uh, or this murder down in Hollandale Beach of uh, Toronto couple Rochelle Wise and 71-year-old and her husband, David Pitchkowski. What's What's happening there? You know, I'm going I'm to have to plead that I don't have an update on that one, Joe. Except to say that we've had this happen a little bit. It seems like we get one of these every year or so, where you've got a Canadians out of the country living somewhere who end up dead and uh, no answers. We seem to be getting those on at least a yearly basis. Well, the officers from Hollandale Beach did come to Toronto, as you know, and uh, Dave Woodard uh, tells me that they're going to have a news conference from there uh, with some information. They've already released a surveillance uh, video, so hopefully they've got a lead on it. Uh, you know, for the families. It's it's always the toughest in the families for those ones, Joe. It's always uh, the toughest in the families. Let's uh, let's go quickly to Steve. Is it staff inspector? This story never seems to go away. He's charged with uh, misconduct under the Police Act. He comes in every day and signs in. He still gets paid, and yet they keep on doing it. Yeah, this is another crazy one, Joe. Where I'm going to talk a bit about the process here, how it doesn't work for. Uh, I've talked to it doesn't work for the complainants. It doesn't work for the police. I'm going to tell you how this one doesn't work for the taxpayers, as well as it probably didn't work for a, a superintendent uh, or staff inspector, Izzard. He was charged uh, for an offense that was alleged to have been convicted of, of done in 2007 of sexually harassing a female who worked for him in the intelligence unit. Now, by all accounts, he's not Mr. Friendly necessarily. He's a bit of a bully, is the way he has been described throughout his trial. But here's the funny thing, Joe. He was on, been on the job for 25 years in 2007. You know, his trial, just he just got convicted this past Friday. That's four years and four months from the time that he was charged until the trial was dealt with. Or to put that more in perspective, twice as long as Constable Kavanaugh's murder charge took to deal with. And in that four years, what do you figure he was paid? Well, the, he's listed on the Sunshine List as making $135,000 a year. So, you know, we're into the tune of, uh, close to $600,000, yeah. I mean, so he, he's well paid to come in and sign he was in. 25 years, it's taken five years, so that puts him in a 30-year pension as well. Well, th- call me a cynic, Joe. Call me, this is where, you know, he gets convicted of his misconduct. They're going to give him his sentence uh, yet. He hasn't been uh, sentenced, and he can still appeal that. But it sure looks to me like this trial was specifically stretched out so he could get to his 30 years of service to get his full pension, which is, uh, that's a pretty big jackpot uh, that uh, you score. Let's flip it over to, we've only got a minute or so here, the police tribunal, small claims court, Eric Brazo. Uh, he's the guy that held the folks, uh, that held up the sign at the uh, Ryan uh, Russell's funeral. I covered that story, and actually I was called as a witness, and I, I was surprised to bump into you there, but you actually were down covering that as well. I went down to cover it for a couple of reasons. I mean, number one, the case is, it's a terrible case because uh, for Mr. Brazo to do what he did was a terrible and wrong thing. For the police to have to jump on him to get rid of him was a terrible and wrong thing. But here's the interesting part about that, Joe. The, 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 
The complaint has been taken to small claims court by a lawyer by the name of Davin Charney. What he does is he goes around the uh, OIPRD and the complaint system, and he goes right to small claims court. Because what happens there is you get a fast resolution, and if you end up winning, there's a financial reward for it, as opposed to the OIPRD system where it gets dragged out and people are very, very unsatisfied with it. So it's, it's pretty unique in that it goes right in front of a justice, an actual sitting judge. Yeah, I tell you, as a guy, I was called to tes- testify, and I was pretty nervous. But you know, I I just wanted to sort of st- just tell what I saw. They asked me questions of what I saw. I didn't see him. His allegation is he was assaulted. I didn't see that. I only saw the arrest. And the, as you heard there, they both lawyers were asking me if I heard any, you know, screaming or that kind of thing, which I I didn't. So I tried my best just to tell the court, you know, what I what I saw. I don't know how I did, but and I don't know if it helps the case at all. But I was, it was, I hadn't done that in a long time. I testified one time in a prelim at a murder case because I came back with a suspect on an airplane and he talked to me. But that's the first time in like twenty years that's happened. Well, you know, that's the interesting thing about so many of these uh, police cases with discipline, Joe. That's part of the point of why this lawyer takes the small claims court because they never get to court. It takes forever, and people don't testify. You know, on, on the route with the small claims court, once you file the, the, the charge, they have to file a written defense within 30 days. Otherwise, they could be found in default. And the small claims court judge, as you saw when he was up there talking to you, he wants to get to the job and get to the truth and get it done and yeah, move he was, along and get resolution. His name was uh, Judge Richardson. No nonsense. I really liked the guy. I'd love to write a, a book on this guy or something. He was so cool. Listen, Ross, thank you very much uh, for, for helping us through this, and we'll talk to you again soon. And everybody out there in Scrawler land, and on Late Shift Land, thank you so much. Now we're going to go to the news with Michelle Rosa. See you next week. Scrawler out.